Uh, I've got a few more updates. Uh, I've got one on the government center uh, maintenance. Uh, Public Works Director Pat Bigler is going to do that, and this is on maintenance only. And then she's going to be followed by uh, Inspections and Codes Director John Hudgison and Deputy City Manager Pam Hodge on government center repairs, construction, and insurance. So Pat Bigler is going to talk about maintenance. They are going to talk about repairs, construction, and insurance following Pat Bigler. So with that, um, our Director of Public Works, Pat Bigler. Good evening. How are you all this evening? Hello. Before I start my presentation, I have a small announcement to make. This week, Public Works was notified that we are officially the 146th city in all of North America to achieve accreditation through the American oh, Public yeah, Works great. Association. Fantastic. We went through our inspection about two weeks ago. There are literally 29,000 cities that qualify. And in over 20 years, only 146 have achieved that particular goal. And we did it with a perfect score. So we were awarded 100% on that accreditation inspection. I'm really proud of my staff. They worked very, very hard to achieve that. We've put several years into preparing programs that would allow us to qualify for accreditation. So it has been a very worthwhile effort. This evening, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about maintenance at the Government Center. Um, I would like to um, just kind of say, you know, taking care of an old building is kind of like taking care of an old car. You can do the maintenance, you can stick very closely to the manufacturer's recommendations, you can make sure that the oil gets changed, the fluids get changed, the filters get changed, um, you can even do major repairs, but when all is said and done, when it hits about 10 or 12 years, you're going to have breakdowns, and that is what we are experiencing now with the Government Center. We have been taking care of the building, and, um, but it has reached that age where things are starting to happen. So let me talk to you a little bit first about the background so that everybody has kind of a, is brought up to speed, and then talk to you about some of our maintenance program. The building was um, opened in 1971. At that time, there was no certificate of occupancy issued. Uh, I can only assume, and to my knowledge, the building did not fully meet code at that time where it would have been awarded a certificate of occupancy. Uh, it was built with an open concept. Um, cubicles were expected to go in, and they only actually built out about six or seven of the 12 floors at that time. So it wasn't completely built out. As times passed, more people moved in, they started building walls instead of cubicles, and then they'd start chopping up those, they'd build a conference room, and you know, a few years later they decide they need more offices, and they'd chop that into three offices and put up some walls. Um, none of those changes were made um, very thoughtfully. We have only a handful of the few original drawings, and of course with the changes that were made over time, no drawings or permits were issued for that work. So none of that work has been documented either. Um, of concern, the fire alarms were blocked by walls. The air conditioning wasn't modified when the walls were moved. And electrical was run to whatever was convenient. So we have places in the building where to turn off the electric for down here, you have to go up to the other floor. And those changes were not documented. Some of our uh, employees are familiar with where you might have to go and some of those idiosyncrasies, but it's, um, it's tough. It's not well documented at all. Prior to my arrival here in, in the, at the end of 2011, um, changes were made without drawings or permits, as I said. 
Um, and when I came and started looking at the situation, I alerted management of the fragility of the system. I did that in early 12, and we talked about significant issues to do with security, utilities, fire safety, et cetera. We then came back later in 2012 and did an executive closed session with council to talk, that was when we were still in the government center, and we talked about the issues that existed with that building. At that time, it was determined that we were gonna do a full assessment of the building, and that happened in 2013. Two WR and Faithful and Gould performed that evaluation, that assessment, and they evaluated the cost for renovation or multiple replacement options to, to fall around 100 million to 120 million. Um, I'm not keeping up, I apologize. They did confirm that all of the systems in the building needed replacement or significant upgrade. They additional, then additional presentations of their findings were made to council, and then we had other sessions with council over time. Um, and following that, a commission was formed to, to study alternatives. And they spent some time trying to decide which option would be better and made some recommendations to council also. Um, in 2012, I instructed that no work would take place in that building without, by my staff or anyone else without obtaining a building permit and getting an architect's seal on the drawings to ensure that we weren't making the situation in that building worse. <coughs> That rule continues in effect today. And we've had some confrontations with folks who wanted to go ahead and do things. And uh, with the support of the city manager, that did not happen. We have stuck to that rule and we intend to continue to follow with that rule. Uh, several items identified during that asse assessment were things that we could take care of and we move forward with taking care of them. By 2014, we put in a backflow preventer. That was one of the issues they'd identified. We were able to afford that within our existing operating budget. Um, there was a need to look at whether we needed pressure reducing valves and that was evaluated and the recommendations were followed there. Um, so there has been follow up there from that assessment. Let's see, something's going on. Okay, just briefly, facilities maintenance, my crews, their task is to do, the needed, new, do all the needed routine maintenance and repair on all the city buildings and the other infrastructure to include doing custodial work. I have a staff of 30 who do all of those. Out of that, the facilities have only four plumbers. Now we have 600 plus facilities. We have 400 plus sprinkler systems that those plumbers take care of. And then we have 500 plus other infrastructure everything from public bathrooms to <laughs> you name it. Uh, I would say on the whole that the crew does a phenomenal job um, and I bring 35 years of experience in the public works and facilities arena and I can tell you they do a f phenomenal job keeping up with all of that with the staff and the resources they have. We also, point the wrong way, okay. Um, we have put in place, we had some contracts in place, we put others in place, and we will continue to refine contracts as we need them to provide professional support. No matter how good you are, you don't know everything about everything. And you know, we're not certified for everything. So we have a specific contractor who takes care of our elevators. We have a one that assists us with larger jobs or more complex work on mechanical systems. We have a contractor who helps us with roofing systems, with fire protection systems, and with our generators. Um, and I could go on and on and on, but I won't spend any more time with it. Every day in the government center, they walk through every mechanical room in that structure, in that complex, and they look at every piece of machinery to see if they can spot any problems. They walk around the outside of the building twice per day um, they check, the elevators have a computer and they check that computer every day to make sure that there are no glitches going on with our elevators. They check the lift station pumps every single day to
to make sure that those lift stations continue to operate. Um, on a less, not less than daily basis, they, we purchased infrared uh, equipment so that we can check the mechanical rooms. If you've got bearings that are starting to wear, they heat up and we can identify those in advance of a problem with the infrared cameras. Uh, we also do infrared checks of the electrical system about every three months because we want to make sure there are no hot spots there either. Uh, we do load tests on the generators once per month and we run the generator once every week without putting a load on it to make sure that it turns off and on and off properly. Uh, we do the checks, monthly checks of the HVAC system and we change filters and we do all of the needed maintenance and the manufactured recommended <coughs> maintenance. And then we also check Freon, for example, and we have a hot contractor who will recharge if we're finding that the Freon is low. And again, there's a long list of things they do that I don't need to get into, but they do follow manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, this is a very important point. We don't just patch. If we have a problem, we take the time to analyze what has caused it. It's like the doctor giving you something for the flu, but not trying to, you know, for pain or a headache and not trying to figure out what, why you have a headache. We try to make sure. And when we do, that's resulted in identification of some more systemic problems. The two largest ones that I thought I would mention were those hot water lines where we found a rusted out connector and we had a leak. Instead of just fixing it, we started looking at what caused it and whether we had similar situations throughout the building. And we ended up with a contract to fix a couple of hundred of those because dissimilar metals had been used throughout the building. We also, as you know, buildings built in 71 don't have the same electrical requirements as we do today. We've added computers, we've added all kinds of, of doohickeys and doodads, and all of them draw power. Um, our systems became overloaded, and rather than try to, to, to do a total retrofit, which is expensive, we started doing things like installing LED lighting, which significantly reduced the load throughout the building, also saved us on our electrical bills. And so we have been doing things like that uh, with forethought and to be as proactive as possible to eliminate future crises when we can. Um, we're also responsible for the structure. Uh, we, a couple of years ago, had a bad crack in one of the windows up on the 11th floor. That was not an easy thing for us to deal with, but it was clearly part of our, our what we're responsible for and we took care of it. Um, let's see. <laughs> the generators, you know, went out a few years ago and this is what it looked like when it finally completely blew. That generator is sitting in the basement and the building was built around it. We cannot get it out, which is why we have a generator sitting out on the street. This is a, a gate valve that um, in one of our systems, gate valves tend to stick and break if there's any grit in the system. And I hate to tell you, but with a building from 71, there's a lot of grit in that system these days. Plumbing is, without question, our most challenging and problematic and complicated uh, system to work on. We have cut off valves on all of our fixtures, but they are the original fixtures that came, the valves that came with those fixtures. Um, on all 196 sinks and 197 toilets and urinals, um, but they are fragile and we really need to systematically go through the building and replace every one of those gate valves with a ball valve because we know that's a sticking point. Um, at this time, and I need to explain this to you just so you understand the complexity of what we deal with, because we don't have gate valves on every, valves on every floor, when we need to do mechanical work, we've got to shut the building, off, the water off to the entire building and drain it down. So before we do that on a Saturday morning, we go through and try to identify anything and everything that might need to be fixed that weekend. Um, and we get scheduled so that we have the right materials and people there. So we go, 
to drain the whole building, we literally start at the top and start opening up valve. We shut off the water outside. We start opening up the valve on every sink, and we go from floor to floor to floor. It takes three hours to drain down to the second floor. And once we get there, we have about 45 minutes left because after that, the cooling towers start draining, pressure starts dropping in the fire system, and we end up with all the fire alarms going off and other major issues. We start working at the top and follow the water down so that we have enough time to get those repairs done. And, but at the end of that three hours and 45 minutes, we have to go back and turn the water back on or we have major issues. Um, so then we turn the water back on and we go back up to the top and we stand and wait until all the water gets out of the line and the faucets that are open start draining again. And once they're running fully in the sinks and the air is out of the lines, then we can start turning them off. We flush the toilets a couple of times, but we have no way other than that to drain the air. And we go from floor to floor to floor, doing that on every floor. And then they go back up to the top and they check everything to make sure we haven't got any more leaks. And then they also flush the toilets a couple of more times to try to ensure that we get as much air out of the lines as possible. Um, and then eventually, after about the third time through the building, they leave the building. And you need to note that still, that many flushes, there are still times when they go away, and a half hour later, somebody in the building flushes the toilet, and it blows a line apart. And then we're back in there trying to do the same thing that we were doing before. We start at the top and turn off the water and <laughs> drain the system. It is painful, it is time consuming, I can't tell you how much overtime we use, and it is very, very inefficient and ineffective. Um, let's see. So, what do we need to do? Hang on. We need to replace, I'm shifting gears here a little bit, but we also need to replace all the drain lines to include roof drains. Um, all of those drains, sewage drains and roof drains, so whether it's stormwater or sanitary, are made out of cast iron and they are beginning to split. And usually they split on the top of the pipe, not the bottom. So it, things will go along perfectly fine until we had a day when a certain number of people flush the toilet all at one time and suddenly you've got sewage dripping down and we're going in trying to figure out where the split is we cannot see it from the floor and we're trying to figure out what's going on there if we do that work we have to do it nights and weekends if we can because it's noisy we have to cut that cast iron that interferes with the courts and other work and um, so if we eventually get to this, we're going to need a time and materials contract. We're going to need assistance from a contractor. And then we're going to have to pray that nobody flushes the toilet up above us while all that work is going on. And we do repairs on a fairly regular basis on that system because it's starting to crack pretty often. You can see the crack there, I think, pretty clearly. And that's very typical of some of the things we're dealing with. This is a location where it just deteriorated to the point where it fell apart. So it cracked all the way around. And you can see how much gunk is in there. Since 1971, those pipes have been there and accumulating stuff. Um, now, this is in, on one of the floors, on the 11th floor. You can see the cast iron pipe up there. And it is way up in the air. So you can understand that it's not that easy to ascertain where a leak might be coming from because it's coming from somewhere up there. And it takes special equipment to get in. It means working over their heads. It's very uncomfortable. And this is kind of give you an idea of the, the condition of some of those drain pipes. Um, we are constantly trying to flush them out. Some of them will flush, some of them will not. Um, and that creates a challenge for our work crews too. 
building access. Many of the occupants over the years have changed the locks on their doors, and we no longer have access to a lot of areas. So if we have a flood over the weekend, we have no idea what might be going on in those locked areas. We are going to go through and change the cylinders and put in a master key system. We've been, yes. Um, so we have probably 150 offices and locations we can't get into. Um, so we're going to need to go back. That's going to be roughly $50,000 to get back to a master key system. Um, and I feel like I missed something because I was talking about the plumbing, but we do need to replace the ball, ball valves with those other valves. Um, and so, let's see, I've lost track, I'm sorry. Um, in addition to that, what was recommended and what still remains to be done is we need to pressurize the stairwells for fire safety, which means installing vent fans and replacing doors. That's not work that can be done by our crews, but it still was identified during that um, evaluation of the building and still remains to be fixed. The fire alarm systems, um, we can't, I can't go in and put in a fire alarm because I have to put in whatever is current to code and our current infrastructure in the core um, won't support the new fire alarms with strobes and, and the other required things. So we have to do that center core to provide that. If we do that, we need to replace the fire alarms throughout the building to make sure that every place can hear the fire alarms, see the fire alarms, and can respond to them. Uh, we need to do, we also, the air conditioning system, the controls that are there, quite honestly, are so outdated. The company's gone bankrupt. It's proprietary. We actually can't do anything, and we need to replace the controls in order to be able to get some amount of control over the conditions in the various and sundry offices. All of that said, if we're going to replace the valve, put valves on each floor so we can shut off, and we've been working on this, and I did miss the slide, the valves, there are three, we have to have three on each floor, but things have changed so much that we do not, and we don't have drawings, we do not know where to place all of those valves in order to be able to actually shut off the, the water on a given floor. We are working with the contractor right now trying to evaluate where those points might be because it's, it's just not a clean, this line takes care of this floor. In addition, we have to have a valve for the hot water, a valve for the cold water, and a valve for the recirculating water on each of the floors. Um, Inspections and Codes has already been trying to find a contractor to work on these with us, and quite honestly, they're all reluctant to take it on because it is so complex and it's such a puzzle. Um, so, but we need to keep moving forward and try to make it happen one way or the other. If we want to change the gate valves to ball valves, it's going to cost about $80,000. The lock replacement will be about 50. The drain line replacement will be about two and a half million dollars. And the AC controls will be about $800,000. That's a total of $3.48 million worth of work that is badly needed as soon as we can identify a source of funds. In addition to that, those three fire safety issues, the fire alarm system needs, it will cost around 600. Pressurizing the stairwells will cost around 850. And installing a sprinkler system, which is mentioned pretty often and uh, was in that assessment, it will be about a million. So for fire safety, we're talking 2.45 million for a total of $5.93 million. That is not everything that needs to be done, but if we're going to replace the building somewhere down the road, um, we need to make a decision to invest and move forward with some of these projects. The facilities in public works will continue to do what we can with the resources and manpower we have, but it will take some additional money to contract. Um, and council will eventually need to make a decision about the future of that building, whether to renovate or tear it down as recommended by the consultants we hired in 2013. 
questions? So, Madam Mayor, with that, um, they are here to answer any questions, but I can tell you I asked the Public Works uh, Director to um, put together this uh, maintenance um, status uh, update of the Government Center building. Um, we are going to have to come to a position that we're either going to have to renovate that building or we are going to have to construct a new building. Uh, there's just no way around it. Uh, we need to spend significant dollars um, to um, be able to stay in that building for some period of time. And I've talked to staff and even if we were going to consider let's say a special purpose local option sales tax that would provide dollars to renovate or construct a new building. Let's say that we were going to do that in 2020. Um, if we, if dollars were made available to us through a special purpose local option sales tax and you um, allowed or issued bonds that we were able to advance the dollars and go ahead and complete or move forward with a project to renovate or tear down, construct new, or construct new somewhere else. I asked staff, how long would that take? Is that a three-year, five-year, six-year, eight-year period? In other words, you'd have to get the dollars in hand, you'd have to get architects involved, You'd have to do all the engineering work. Uh, you'd have to go through a bid process, uh, which would be lengthy, do all the things you got to do. And once you go through the review with council and select a construction vendor, uh, then construction is going to take two, three years to get it done you're looking at six or eight years, even if you had money in hand today to renovate or construct new. So I'd ask staff, identify those things that we must do, that we need to do, if we're going to be in that building another six years, eight years. And so I've asked them to start identifying systems that we need to update because we've got employees coming into that building every day, those buildings, and we've got the public, and we've got courts, and we've got everything going on. And again, we know that if we had dollars today, we'd end up five, six, eight years down the road before you could turn a key and move into a renovated building or a new building. And so we are going to have to spend significant dollars just to stay in that building until we do something different. And in all likelihood, we're going to spend money that we are going to have to come back and in the renovation process, a lot of it, you're going to lose it. <laughs> you know, but what do we need to do to stay in the building right now to continue to conduct the people's business. And, and those are the, do, the, the numbers that she's throwing out to you tonight, the systems that we've got to take care of, and we've got to find the money. And so that's why I've separated. This is the maintenance piece of it, and they are working every day with a challenging building, trying to maintain it. And so after you've asked her, them, the questions that you have, then we're going to come and talk to you about the repairs of, as a result of the flood and what construction work needs to be d done, our dealings with the insurance company, and the timeline. Wait until you hear the timeline for just doing this. And we're going to remind you of some timelines where we've had some other situations, like at Comer, like at the Annex building when we had the issue there, like at Fire Station 11, 
from the time it burned or we had to damage at Comer until the time we resolved it with the insurance company and they were able to move in, they're going to tell you about it. And so they're going to tell you about the timeline for getting back to normal business at the government center. But Pat Beagler and her staff uh, are here to answer any questions about maintenance, Madam Mayor. It doesn't look like we have questions on maintenance at this time, so maybe move on sure. to John and maybe there'll be a, a questions when the entire presentation is concluded. Okay. Well, and so don't go anywhere, just wait. And uh, we're going to have uh, inspections and codes director John Hug Hudgeson and our Deputy City Manager for Finance, Planning, and Development, Pam Hodge. Good evening, Council. Um, I'll kind of fly through a few of these just to kind of give you an update again. Like we've uh, talked previously about Incident 1, uh, so that's the 10th and 11th floors continue to be off limits, but 9th floor and below are available. Uh, incident 2, uh, 4, 3, and 2 are open for citizens and will be operational as um, repairs continue. Um, we've nullified the air quality concerns. We had some concerns about that, and we tested the tower and the wings. So we didn't have any concerns with any of that. Um, just kind of a recap of the working conditions so people can kind of see what we have going on, um, how uh, some of the areas are being kind of cordoned off and how people are dealing with uh, missing ceiling tiles and things like that. Um, one of the pros about this project is that we've kind of been able to, to divvy up these sections you see here between Serve Pro, the buildings, the content, the labor and utilities between different departments. So we've had, instead of typically in the past when we get a claim, it's kind of mostly on engineering and public works to kind of sift through all of this and then get, get it done. But ideally with this one, because it was a major project and we were dealing with one of the major buildings here in the city, different departments have helped separate all this work. So my job was kind of more on the building side. We had risk, risk management kind of do more on the contents and serve pro. We've had um, finance help us with the utilities. We've had everybody's kind of keeping track of labor costs. So we're able to split the claim up into different departments instead of kind of sequential. All these things are being attacked simultaneously. Um, so I'll show you the timeline, which has definitely been in our favor. Um, serve pro, if we've talked before, they've completed all their finishing, uh, their cleanup right now. The, the only part they will come back to do, depending on the contents that are in the building, that it, um, the contents adjuster did not consider a total loss, that they will have to come and clean, physically come back and clean. So that's a cost that um, they will have to incur at that point. Um, this is the first two claim numbers that we've been given, and this is just for the mechanical and electrical. So this is mechanical, electrical, low voltage, and the camera work um, total about $271,000 for floors 11 through 5. And for floors four through two, about $34,000. So that's roughly um, over uh, $300,000 from the claim. And that's just the mechanical and electrical work. That's not any drywall, any of that kind of stuff. That's just electrical work that needs to be replaced, lights that needs to be replaced, um, receptacles, um, some of the, the mechanical controls we were having issues with. That's just that side of the house. Um, if we're, we're meeting the building uh, general contractor that we're talking with, they're working on their part so you can see some of the extent of work that needs to be done. That flooring that needs to be put back in, that drywall needs to be brought back down to the ground, the vinyl, all that needs to be done. And that's a part of the contractor's work for him to come in to do. And uh, so once those numbers are finalized, we'll bring those back to council and that'll also, once, we, once those have been approved by the insurance company. Um, contents, there's everything that wasn't more or less nailed down. Anything that's in the building from furniture, bookcases, computers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the contents adjusters completed their work. We're waiting to hear back from the insurance company, the official number from that. But once again, we tried to kind of do some of these things um, at the, simultaneously. So we actually got the moving contents. So that's to move all the material because ideally the contractor needs kind of a clean slate. He doesn't need to be going over somebody's desk to be putting carpet in and things like that. So we have a um, cost that's been approved from the um, insurance company for a little over $16,000 to move the materials out of the building as construction goes on and to move them back in. So that number, typically the numbers I have in here have been approved currently by the insurance claim. So we have everything from them. Um, like I told you, uh, mentioned a few slides before, all the departments from sheriff, risk management, public works, IT, engineering, inspections and codes, all of us are keeping up with our hours to submit as a final usage claim as a part of the, the claim due to labor. 
and utilities. Obviously, we had the, the tens, of, tens of thousands of gallons of water that was released in the building, so obviously that would affect our utility bill for that month, depending on what happened because of the leak. So um, finance is looking and breaking down based off of that building what we would normally pay and then what we paid in that month to hopefully recoup, set, recoup some of that cost as well. And also the electricity for running humidifiers 24-7 and that kind of thing, that which, which has increased our, um, our um, power bill. So the next steps here to complete negotiation with the insurance company. Literally, I have a two-hour meeting with them tomorrow to try to get us to a happy medium where everyone agrees to the cost of the work to be done. Um, so we're literally going to go through line by line. I have 314 pages on the first claim and about 171 in the second claim. So we're literally just going to go through it and make sure we're all apples to apples. So if they agree to something, we had a few issues that we've already noticed off top that would reduce the general contractor's cost that the insurance has agreed to. And there's certain things we will just have to, you know, sit down and figure out how, how do we get to the end of it. Um, the intent is to bring that proposal once the insurance uh, approves that number to authorize the contractor to perform the work sometime in September 2018, hopefully by the 11th. I'd love to come and have something ready then. It's just dependent on the insurance approving the number that we submit to them. Um, the contractor that we've talked to has projected a four-month timeline. So they will work 24-7 on floors 10 and 11 as we go for that whole four-month period. And then we'll have to work out scheduling with, with courts and make sure we're not disturbing anything that they have going on for those following months. So ideally, we'd like to have the government center back up in normal operations January or February of 2019. If, like I said, if this timeline continues the way it is, ideally, that's when we'd like to have everybody back in the building open to the public, all the elevators running, no dividers between that, you know, all of it open um, back to um, previous use. Um, just for comparison's sake, I've unfortunately been with the city long enough to deal with all of these in claim situations and dealing with the insurance. So, um, so take um, the annex, which we had a rain event in June of uh, 2011. It was another eight months before we had to work authorized by council officially to bring you all to approve in March of 2012. The Comer Gym, when we had the roof failure, that was in September of 11. We worked with the uh, insurance company, and that was another seven months, and that was brought forward in April of 2012 for approval from council. Fire station number 11, uh, November of 15, when it caught fire, we didn't have numbers to bring to council until April of 2017. But the way we've worked this new project from when the incident happened in June to September is only three months, and we're almost to the point of having a final number approved from the insurance company to proceed with construction. So. I would like to say that we kind of say but the way we divvied up the different tasks up under the claim has definitely helped and expedite the process. So um, that's where we stand right now, and I'll take any questions. So, questions for John. So, Madam Mayor, that's the repair, construction, and our dealings with the insurance and the timeline uh, as we see it today, um, and. Um, as uh, Director Hudges said, um, he's going to meet with uh, the insurance people tomorrow. Uh, there are a lot of documents to go through, and um, the adjuster will come in and look at things. As you know, if you've ever had an incident at your home, the adjuster will come in and, and, and do an assessment and say that here's, here are the things that I found, and here's the cost that we're going to allow to get those things done and then you'll have once we engage our construction company uh, they'll come in and they will do an assessment of the building and they'll say that these are all the things that we need to do and the desire is that those two things match up for what needs to be done and the cost for getting them done but they don't always match up and then that's where the construction company got to do a walk through with the gestures and say, you didn't see this and this has to be done, or you said this would be done and you put a price on it of this, and here's our cost for that. And, and the adjuster will, can, can go out and um, get someone else to look at it, another company, and, and then they come to an agreement. They do that with your car. You, you, your adjuster come out and tell you it's gonna cost $5,000 to repair your car, you take it to the repair shop. Repair shop, put it up, uh, put it on the jack, and um, and say no, they didn't see under the car, the undercarriage. That no, that's another thousand dollars. They call the adjuster out. The adjuster looks at it and say, I agree, and it's six thousand dollars. That's how it's going to work, or that's how it works 
even with uh, what we've got to get done. So that's what we anticipate. That's why he's involved and as an architect and inspections and codes and, and we're going to have the insurance people, we're going to have the construction people and, and we're going to have to come to an agreement. That's where we are. All right, we've got uh, Councillor Thomas. Oh, Mr. Hutchison, I, I have a question about um, the slide that you said next steps there um, <clears throat> that you are uh, hoping to bring a proposal to us in September and the contractor projects a 120 day timeline. Um, as I understood what you were saying, <clears throat> that does not include the kind of work that Ms. Bigler was talking about. This is simply to get us back to where we can move those judges back into their courtrooms and that sort of thing. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. It is just the just the, the previous condition of the building. So none of, none of the improvements that um, that Director Bigler mentioned. Well, it uh, it seems to me, <clears throat> Mayor, that. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have a two-prong situation here. Um, one is our immediate, what are we going to do? And that's what Mr. Hudgenson is saying he's going to do for tomorrow. Starting, uh, well, continue tomorrow with the insurance company. And then, well, maybe even a three-prong. Some of the things that Ms. Bigler said we need to do whether we tear that building down or do anything else to that building or not. And then the third thing is, so what are we going to do overall? And I haven't, I haven't seen, and I, I don't want anybody to take this wrong. I think you folks are doing a hell of a job. You are doing what needs to be done and you are looking out for the citizens of Columbus and their money. But I don't see any um, plan to hit all of those buttons. Uh, how, how are we going to do that? How are we going to make those decisions? <clears throat> how are we going to know that we need to replace that fire system and we need to do it right now, but we can't do it until we replace the entire building. And are we going to tear the building down? Or are we just going <laughs> to? Well, I, I, I'm just, I, 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 can I, you I, tell I'm very I, frustrated? I, the, the, yeah. the point that we're, the reason she's here tonight and presenting maintenance short term, that's it, short term, that 5.9 million or whatever it was, those things um, we have. And, and, and that's why I mentioned, even if we had money today, it'd take five, six, eight years. Those things are short term that we want to do as soon as we can identify dollars. We want to start a process to start getting those systems taken care of to allow us to be in that building without renovation and without going to a new building for the next six to eight years because we're going to have to be there six to eight years. Well, Mr. City Manager, let me just say, and, and it is, it's, it's a dilemma. It's a full-fledged dilemma, so I, I'm not here to offer um, any uh, singular solution. I will say this, I, you know, there are other options, and, and they all have political consequences, and so council's <coughs> going to have to make some tough decisions. But I'm sure it's bothersome to a lot of folks here at this table and maybe watching that there's even being a proposal that $3.5 million would be poured into a building that- Five that, point, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, maybe five point. I guess, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the one page. Oh yes, I'm sorry, 5.9, excuse me. $5.9 million would be poured into a building um, that has to be fundamentally gutted and redone. And, uh, and so that's just like, to me, I'm sorry to be dramatic, burning it in a big, you know, trash can or something because you're only, you're putting in that $6 million for a short period of time. You keep saying six, six years, which would be true if you went for the SPLOST, um, which I appreciate is a way that we've talked about doing it before. Absolutely could do it again, but you need to understand the school board may want that SPLOST. 
Uh, we may have to negotiate with them a little bit. They've been kind about it so far, but you don't know what political winds will blow in the future and what needs they may have. Um, you also, you know, just have some other issues. And so there is the opportunity that we, that I talked about before of going to the building authority, issuing a bond, uh, beginning the design and the construction process as quickly as possible. Now, it's not going to be done in, you know, a year, but it could be done in 24 months, perhaps. Well, no. And, uh, but, well. It, but I'd like to see some proposals on that because I've seen huge buildings go up uh, in Atlanta um, in 24 months. So, you know, uh, if, if we couldn't renovate. But the other thing I think we need to, and so I'm with Councillor Thomas on, I'd like to see a plan on what it would cost uh, and, and what the proposal would be to completely gut the building we have and redo it, uh, to take down the wings, uh, possibly build things there. Um, you know, th those are the types of proposals I think we, we need to see. And the other thing I would say that I keep hearing a lot of folks talk about in the community, sometimes it's elected officials, sometimes it's just citizens that are concerned, is I think we need to hear from the professionals that know that we cannot renovate this building floor by floor. It seems like such a common sense proposal of let's start at the 11th floor, let's gut it, completely redo it, put in new pipes, put in new uh, fire systems, put in all new everything, electrical. And everything I keep hearing from all the professionals is that cannot be done because the systems can't support the new stuff. Because of the way it because was built. Because of the way that it was built originally. originally. So you can do that, but you can't light up the 11th floor once it's finished. You can't <laughs> light up the 10th floor once it's finished. You can't move into these floors until the whole thing is finished. And so I, I think it would be helpful for us to see a methodical plan of those options. And, and you and I disagree on the length of going by the building authority and issuing a bond and be able to service that bond with what has historically been our uh, debt service li uh, amount and finding some other uh, creative ways that Pam has found where we have money for economic development that we put aside and we hold for particular projects that we could put towards this for debt service and some other things that would be fiscally prudent that would shave two or more years off of the timeline that you've given. Um, because the timeline you've given proposes that we go out on a splash in 2020, which is at least two years away. And then, of course, the money has to start being collected, and then you have to start doing all that. I, I, I that agree primer. with you. If, if council makes a decision that they're going to go another route in terms of financing, then it would not be six to eight years. Right. Uh, it would be something less. Uh, but we can't make that decision without more information about what what that's going to do. That's that's my frustration is that I can't tell either one of you tonight that you're right or that you're wrong because I don't have the information. I am not a uh, I'm not an authority on that. There are people who are authorities that can come and you know um, advise us on what we need to do and that's what I'm looking for is how are we going to get the advice that we need as a council in order to move forward? Yeah. And Ms. Bigler, I just have to tell you the thing that you said to me, that you said tonight, that just knocked my socks off more than anything, okay. is that there are, there's $50,000 worth of Jeez. keys, locks that people, I worked in that building. It never occurred to me that I had the authority to change the lock on my door. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's elected. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, it's um, that that was well, one of the and, biggest and that's surprises. Why, uh, and that's why, <laughs> Councilor Thomas, we we back in 2012, we instituted a policy. You know, we have people wanting to put ceiling fans in. We don't want you even painting in your. I, I mean, we just not, don't do anything, and we're not doing it without an architectural stamp seal and without getting the same building permit that we expect others to go through in a process when they're going to alter their building or their home. But what we're going to do, we're going to bring back, you know, whether we go through the building authority as an option, the um, school district's education plus expires June of 2020, um, and the uh, T-SPLOS expires in 2022. 
And so those are, you know, uh, if, if we did a go through a process now uh, without waiting on those dates, what the timeline would be, and then if we wait on either of those dates, what the timeline would be, and then we're going to do all the things that you've talked about to bring you more information on what the strategy would be and how it would work. And well, so we'll what, what I would like for you to bring to us too, Mr. City Manager, is um, I can't make a decision on whether or not the amount of money that we're going to try to raise in a, in a splash or uh, on a bond issue is the right amount of money without having information from the people who know from the professionals who build buildings all the time and can tell me what we need to do in that building. And we make a decision, are we gonna, are we gonna tear the wings down? I don't know. Because yeah. well, that, those decisions haven't been made because they haven't been talked about by this body, which is the body that will be making those decisions. Well, I thought the mayor's commission Awful. Yeah, and, and it did, and, and it did, but I'll tell you this that's come, because we've had a lot of discussions. I just think that there's no way around having the discussions right here. Um, it, it's council feels more comfortable that way. Um, you know, I just think that uh, the commission was, was helpful, but we all know, you know, it gave a price tag of $100 million, which is sticker shot, but nobody's going to give you a better estimate until you have a more refined plan because you're just asking them for some conceptual building that might look like something. And so they just throw some numbers at well, you. And you know, and you, so, have, yeah, you have to pay for that. Right. And so, and, and you have to be willing to pay for that, which we couldn't do in the Mayor's <laughs> yeah. Commission. But I will say this I think that, and we've got some folks queued up, I think if we could come back at the next meeting and continue the conversation on your agenda. Uh, with more refined proposal of if we did it this way and if we did it that way, sure. what that would mean, as much information as we have, then council could direct, I want more information on this and more information on that. Now, you know, just from the, the professionals I've talked to and you guys will hear, the closer we get to what a design would look like, which is going to be awfully far down the road, is when you start getting more refined numbers. So there's no doubt that off that $100 million, there's probably 10 or $20 million that can be shaved off. I mean, at least, you know, it just depends yeah. on what you're going to do. But um, but you're going to have to get a little further down the road of, well, of what it is you want. So, well, But there's a lot of decisions to be made before Councilor that. Councilor Thomas, I, I hear what you're asking, and we'll try and move in that direction okay. with coming back with that. Let's see. We've got Councilor Woodson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a question because I was just checking with Gary, make sure I wasn't dreaming. But I thought something came to us where there was three different designs with three different dollar amounts that was presented to us. Am I correct? That yeah, and I said that that was the mayor's commission. That was the that mayor's would give commission? You, and that would give you, I, we can resend that. That would give you a good basis to understand what's already been done and what the proposals are. But those proposals could be very much refined. Okay, and also the school system, when they did their bidding for Spencer High School, um, they did a, what was it, a refined? I can't remember what it's called, a master contractor. A master contractor or something? Sure. That it cost, the, it, it, was it a master contract? They did a, what it was called a master contract. And, you know, it came way below budget. Maybe we can get with the school system to see how they did the proposal of uh, Spencer High School. We're all thinking it's called a, a major design contract. build. Design <laughs> build. Kind CM of at risk. CM That's at risk. That's how we did this build. Yeah. 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 But you know, there was a proposal, and because of that method, they were able to just change things well, on their own. Well, that's what we did with this building. Oh, that's what they did with when this one. When we built this building. Okay. Yes. And they saved millions. <laughs> And, and it's an outstanding building, I mean, and it's yeah. a state-of-the-art But we could save too. millions, too, when we get down there, down to the point of, of being able to value engineer. We just... So let us, we'll, we'll okay. work on that. We know. Right. We'll, We've got we'll Councillor uh, Allen. Um, would it, would time, would it, would you have enough time if we were to have a work session on the 18th? I think this is the 18th of September. Um, is that to talk about, to get well, everybody, get the 
everybody judicial in here and sit down and talk to the consultants that Council Thomas is talking about? Yeah, I don't think we have a work session on on the 18th. No, that's not. No, I'm saying would would yeah. if you call if one. we call one oh, yeah. on the 18th, would that give you enough time? I to think get we could try and work something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I'll have to quite see if schedules will work out and and all that. But yeah, if you get a call meeting, you have to be in the morning. Yeah, it have to be a morning because. Oh well, yeah, I, I can't be here at night. Yeah, can you? So anyway. we, we could do a morning meeting. Anyway, okay. Um, I think that uh, right. that's very well taken, Councillor Allen. A work session could be something we could get a well, lot of folks a, here. And I know councillors have said that they have trusted experts that they'd like to hear from, and maybe we can invite those people to come and at least listen. And if they want to speak, then they can speak and so forth. And we certainly have a lot of folks who've already worked on this. Yeah. Um, pro yeah. bono, you know, yeah. gratis for us, and they would be here to lend their expertise sure. as well. Okay. We can work on a date for a, a work session. Okay. All right. We've got um, Councillor Pugh. We also are going to have things about what judges want. I think what? What the judges want and need in the courtrooms, because this building is going to be more geared toward judges than anything else. Yeah. yeah, most certainly. I would say, you know, it's kind of like how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time. Um, there's almost a necessary preliminary decision to make before you get down. I agree with you. It's going to be predominantly a judicial building. Um, but it seems to me that before you start deciding uh, what the building is going to look like or, you know, is, is which way you're going to go with this. And I think that being uh, whether you do a bond or whether you do the SPLOST, and I think you'll have a very good sense of what decision you'd like to make once you see a timeline and, uh, you know, once you see how various things could be funded. So okay. that could be the first part of the presentation. And then, but, the, but some of that design work related to um, the judiciary has already been done in the, in the commission. So that would be at least a starting point. Okay, so we're looking at this 18th and then maybe well, some other dates well, too? Well, maybe uh, unless you want to do a morning on the 18th, I, I was just thinking maybe we could do something early October. Okay. And that way we got more time to pull people together and, and have enough information to have a good discussion. If that's right. okay with you all. Okay, well, yeah, why don't you just get with, um, you know, Lindsay and okay. see what dates might work and okay. let's do if it. If there are no other questions, uh, Madam Mayor, um, I am going to, I know you're going to be crushed, but I, I'll delay the transportation update. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but the finance monthly update is not the traditional 